Good evening and welcome to my backyard uh, patio here at St. John's Rectory in Fordyce. Uh, usually uh, on the last Thursday of each month I uh, host a theology on tap uh, and it's usually at either the station also called the mall in Fordyce or Boondocks, a local restaurant we rotate each month. However, the month of March, I was not able to have it because of the uh, coronavirus situation. And uh, I decided to make it up tonight. And then again, next Thursday, if this works well enough, um, have it for the month of April. So tonight uh, is actually the, the March makeup. Um, I originally had a different uh, topic in mind, but uh, since we're in this Easter season, in the second week of Easter, uh, I thought it would be uh, appropriate tonight to uh, review the covenant history. Uh, because on Holy Thursday, when we began the sacred triduum, those holy three days of Holy Week, um, on Holy Thursday, we celebrated the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper that Jesus had with his apostles in that upper room in Jerusalem. Um, and it was at that moment that Jesus gave us the Eucharist. He gave us his body and blood. Um, he instituted the Mass. And so uh, during that, he said the following words that we call the words of consecration. But with the chalice, the cup, he said, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant. And so what Jesus instituted, not just at the Last Supper, but what Jesus gave us is the sixth and final covenant of which we now today are living. Uh, we are a living part of that covenant. Uh, so I thought it'd be appropriate to um, take some time and review uh, the covenant. So hopefully uh, uh, you have your beer or drink, water, pop, whatever. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, evening. It's a lot less windy uh, tonight than it was uh, the last couple of evenings. Uh, so this will work out well. So when we talk about uh, the covenants, the covenants um, began in the very beginning. Uh, when God created uh, everything. In the story of creation, uh, the first two chapters of the book of Genesis uh, we have the two stories of creation. Now, it might seem odd, well, why are there two stories of creation? Well, the two stories of creation actually complement each other uh, to give us a full picture of what God created and who God created, particularly when God created man. Male and female, he created them in his image and likeness. And so the two stories really bring us to a fullness of um, this beauty that we have in the covenant history. So when God created, we have the days of creation. And uh, if you read uh, chapter one of Genesis, the first creation story, um, it has uh, sort of the layout of um, the days and what God created in each day. But I'd like to point out how at the end of each day, God looked at what he had done, what he had created, and he said, this is good. But then when he got to the sixth day in which he created man, uh, male and female, he created them in his image and likeness. At the end of that day, he looked at what he had created and he never said this is good, but rather this is very good. There's something that sets apart us as humans, something how God created us in his image and likeness, that sets us apart from all the rest of creation. Now, just to pause there for a little bit, um, to fill you in, what, what sets us apart? Well, two things. One, our intellect, reason, the ability to gain knowledge, to think, but then also our free will. And reason and will work together and they make us uniquely human, set apart from the rest of creation. But when God created Adam and Eve, when God created man, 
it was the beginning of the first covenant, meaning God was one. There was original unity. We, we heard that in the opening prayer actually this morning uh, for the mass or uh, evening mass. It would have been uh, the same uh, today, but the opening prayer uh, talks about that restoration to the original. St. John Paul the second really helped bring us to understand in his theology of the body this originalness that God created in us. But in God's original plan, there was no sin, huh? And so in chapter 1 and chapter 2, we see the beauty of creation. We see the magnificence of what God had done. But there's this unity between man and God. They're one. Chapter 3 of Genesis, though, breaks that original covenant. In that original covenant, the sign of that covenant was creation itself. The beauty of what God had done. And what that original covenant had created was one holy couple. And I'm going to be bringing back that understanding. Because every covenant, as we go through covenant history, though briefly uh, tonight, every covenant you'll see there's a sign for that covenant. And that covenant creates something. Um, and we see it progress. So, in this original covenant, God, in his creation, signified this covenant, and it created one holy couple. Now, that one is obviously connected to the unity. Holy, because we're one with God. That connection that God created us, we're created, made in his image and likeness. God, who is all holy, made us in his image and likeness. So we're one and holy. But he created us male and female. And so there's that unity and that beauty in that original marriage, if you will. But as we know in the third chapter of Genesis, the fall takes place. And with the fall, it's, it's more than just um, a sin occurred. The devil used this time, the, the serpent introduced things into our life, into human history with the fall. It was more than just the sin. If you recall the story of the fall, here is Eve and Adam in the garden. And Eve is by this tree and the serpent comes up to Eve. And the serpent asks a question. So you cannot eat from any of the trees in the garden? Now, that was the setup. It wasn't just a simple question. Eve responds. Now, another story, but imagine if Eve wouldn't have responded. Another story. But Eve responds, oh no, we can eat from any of the trees in the garden except the one in the center, lest we die. And the serpent responds, surely you will not die. What did the serpent just do? Insert doubt. You see, the devil's the father of lies. And one of the great lies that he uses against us is doubt. So by asking that question, he then set Eve up to say, surely you will not die. Well, Eve saw that that tree looked good. The fruit looked good to eat. She took and ate. She shared with Adam and he ate. Again, another story. Adam should have been doing some other things, maybe like stopping her, but he didn't. And immediately their eyes were opened. They saw that they were naked. They quickly found fig leaves, sewed them, and covered themselves. First, the serpent, the devil, inserted doubt. They recognized, saw that they were naked, and covered themselves. Now the serpent has inserted shame. 
And then they heard God walking in the garden and they hid. Insert fear. So you see, much more happened than just the fall, just sin entering the world. What entered with that sin originally was doubt and shame and fear. And that doubt, shame, and fear throughout human history, it's why Jesus, the Son of God, why, and we'll get to that when we get to that final and eternal covenant, it's why Jesus came and did what he did to restore us to original. Jesus came to conquer that shame, to doubt, that shame and fear. So this first covenant has been broken. But one of the things that's so beautiful about scripture is that we see God's love for us. God never stops loving us. He keeps chasing us. That's the unconditional love of God. And so though the fall took place, though that first covenant that created one holy couple and was signified by all of creation, though that was broken, God never gave up. Enter the story of Noah. Noah was a man of faithfulness. And in that faithfulness, though sin abounded once it had entered, God found in this man, Noah, faithfulness that though God wanted to just wipe out creation, he was sick of it. He's like, I should flood this place and get rid of it. Why did I do? Why did I create this? Why? But in Noah, he found faithfulness. And so Noah was given instructions how to build the ark. And fast forward a little bit, he builds this ark. Noah and his wife, their three sons and their wives are spared. And he's also instructed how to bring the animals on two by two. That's God's love. That's God's mercy. God did not want his beautiful creation made his image likeness, mankind, to be destroyed. He's a merciful God, a loving God. So, with Noah and his family in the ark, the second covenant is brought in. God institutes this second covenant, and the sign of this covenant is the rainbow. The rainbow that appears at the end of the storm. But notice that it was Noah and his family that was spared because of Noah's faithfulness. And so, the second covenant created one holy family. So notice that progression, one holy couple, one holy family. But yet, though God did never, did not break his covenant the first time, nor did he break it the second time, and he spared Noah and his family, and humanity abounded. We come to the story of, uh, the Tower of Babel. So God promised that he would never flood the earth again. God promised in his faithfulness to his people that he would not do that again. But remember, doubt, shame, fear had entered in the world. Well, that doubt abounded. People doubted that God wouldn't, if he got angry again, flood the earth again. So they started bringing, building this tower. They wanted something in case God did, because there was that doubt, they would have a way to get to heaven. And God is just like, why? Why, my people, why? But even though they broke this covenant, the second covenant, through this sin of not trusting, not trusting God's love for them, not trusting what God was telling them that I wouldn't do this again. They broke that covenant. But again, God doesn't give up. God keeps chasing us. And so the next covenant 
is when God calls Abraham. Here's Abraham, and he's with his family. They're in a tribe. And Abraham was also a faithful man. And praying one day, God tells him, I'm going to take you to a promised land. I'm going to take you and give you a land of milk and honey. Just pack up. I will take you there. Now, I always love this story because we know uh, in an imperfect world, marriage isn't always perfect. Um, but I challenge you to think about this marriage between Abraham, at that time Abram, and his wife, Sarai, who becomes Sarah. Uh, think about their marriage for a second. Abram hears God tell him in his prayer, I'm taking you to a promised land, pack up. Lead your whole family, lead the tribe, huh? So Abram runs down. Sarai, Sarai! Yes, Abram, yes, what? God has spoken. Awesome. What did he say? He's taking us to a promised land, a land of milk and honey. We have to pack up and go. God is taking us there. Now, Sarai, what would any wife do? She'd be supportive. Awesome, Abram. Where is this place? You got to love Abram's answer. I, I don't know, but I'm sure God will show us on the way. Sarai trusted. Sarai trusted, they packed up, and the tribe left. This covenant, the third covenant with Abraham, created one holy tribe. And um, the sign of this covenant is somewhat interesting because the sign of it is circumcision. Now, why would God want the sign of this third covenant creating one holy tribe? So watch the progression. One holy couple, one holy family, one holy tribe. Why, when the first covenant was signified by creation, the second covenant was signified by the rainbow, why would this third covenant suddenly be signified by circumcision? Um, not necessarily uh, the most pleasant of things, especially if you're an adult man like Abram. Well, the reason it was the sign is because circumcision as an adult a male isn't uh, uh, pleasant, it's painful, it's messy. Now, that's not to sound crass, but how often isn't our walk of faith, how often isn't our faith journey somewhat messy, somewhat painful? But God is always there. Notice God has never broken these covenants. It's always been broken by the people. And God never gives up. He keeps chasing the people he has created in his image and likeness. He loves us. That's why he doesn't give up. And so now we have this third covenant, creating one holy tribe, signified by circumcision. And as we can probably guess, it's going to get broken. It gets broken with the story we're familiar with of Sodom and Gomorrah. Two cities filled with sin. And the angels tell Abraham that they're going to, God is going to destroy these cities. But remember, in the story, as we can read in Scripture, Lot, the nephew of Abraham, and Lot's family are in the city. They're in Sodom. But they are spared. They are taken before that city is destroyed. However, they were told, do not look back. Keep going forward. Do not look back. And Lot's wife looks back. And she dies. 
So, this third covenant gets broken in the incidents of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so, God still doesn't give up. God loves his people. And so as we read in sacred scripture, God continues and we come to the person of Moses. And it is with Moses that we have the fourth covenant. In the story of Moses, as a baby, his mother, knowing that the Pharaoh of Egypt has called for the murder of all the uh, Israelite boys, because the Israelites are growing in too great a number. Um, they are told us so she sends her baby infant Moses uh, down the river and it's found by the Pharaoh's daughter who then raises Moses. Um, it's found out when Moses is a young adult man that he's not an Egyptian. He finds out he is an Israelite. He has to take off and go in hiding because he kills uh, an Egyptian soldier or a taskmaster uh, for beating one of his fellow Israelites. And so now years pass, but then Moses is called in the, the story, the burning bush. God calls Moses, now an adult man who has a family he's been shepherding out in the hills. God calls him to go and free his people, to free his people, the Israelites, uh, from the Egyptian uh, enslavement. Now, Moses doesn't think he can do this. But God shows him that, as we hear in Philippians, all things are possible. You know, with God in Philippians, all things are possible through Christ who strengthens me. But Moses trusted. He trusted. And so it leads ultimately to the ten plagues. Now, this covenant with Moses and the Israelites created one holy nation. So again, review that history. One holy couple, one holy tribe, one, uh, one holy couple, one holy family, one holy uh, tribe, and now one holy nation. God's covenants keep expanding. And I'll return to that shortly. But in this covenant that created one holy nation, God uses Moses and uses the plagues to ultimately, after the tenth and final plague, the Passover, for the Egyptian Pharaoh to say, get out. Now, that wasn't the end, because the Pharaoh ended up, as we know, chasing the Israelites to try and destroy them, and it leads to the parting of the Red Sea. And the Israelites escape through but the Pharaoh's army is destroyed as the walls of water come crashing down upon them. But I'd like to focus for a moment in this covenant on that 10th plague. I began how the Last Supper, uh, we hear those words, like words of consecration, you know, as Jesus takes the cup Philip Wine says, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant. It will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Well, the tenth plague, the Passover, was when the angel of death was going to pass over Egypt. And the angel of death would strike down that night every firstborn, the family and beast, man and beast. Well, the Israelites were going to be spared from that. 
but they were given specific instructions to celebrate this Passover meal in preparation for the Passover of that angel of death that night. The instructions included killing, uh, sacrificing a one-year-old male lamb, sheep or goat. Um, they were to take the blood of the sacrificed lamb and using a, a branch, and it was a particular branch, hyssop, they were to smear that blood on the doorposts and the lintel of their home. Now each family was to do this, but if a family was small, it could join with another family. But typically it was one sacrificed lamb for each family. Now they were then to take that lamb that had been sacrificed and roast it. And they had this meal that night and they were given prescriptions how to prepare and what to have at this meal. But then with regards to that roasted lamb, there was to be nothing left over. Um, if there was anything left over, it was to be burnt and destroyed. Well, the last part of the Passover meal, the prescriptions was that it was to be a memorial feast. So it was to be celebrated each year. It was a way of the Israelites remembering what God did for them, his incredible love and mercy for them to free them from the Egyptian rule. Well, I'm gonna come back to that Passover meal because the new and eternal covenant, the final covenant which we, in, we have to talk about that last supper connect some dots but the Israelites ultimately are freed from Egypt and they're now in the desert and as we know there's the the 40 years um, that they're in the desert before they ultimately get to the promised land the promised land of which Moses was not able to enter into with them he dies before that but as we've seen these covenants keep getting broken and so, um, what breaks this covenant? Well, this covenant that created one holy nation, um, what broke it was in that desert, we're familiar with the story of um, the golden calf. Moses goes up to pray and he's gone for a while and the Israelites convince Aaron what if he doesn't come back what are we going to do has God abandoned us and Aaron's solution is to gather all the the gold uh, jewelry and so forth that they have that they had taken from the Egyptians and they melt it and form this golden calf and adore it well Moses comes back and he's angry God is angry and so that's what breaks this covenant um, that uh, uh, God had with the Israelites. This covenant that had created one holy nation. Um, and the sign, I don't think I mentioned uh, yet, the sign of this covenant was the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments that God had given the Israelites through Moses on Mount Sinai. But in this adoring the golden calf, the covenant is broken. History continues and we come ultimately to uh, now the story of David. Um, we're familiar with David who ultimately becomes King David uh, following King Saul, the first king of the Israelites. Um, and this covenant with David uh, creates one holy kingdom. So one holy couple, one holy family, one holy tribe, one holy nation, now one holy kingdom. And the sign of this covenant was the temple. The temple that was built 
in Jerusalem. Uh, now, at first, God didn't want this temple, but eventually it gets uh, built, and that's the sign of this covenant. But as we know, that it gets broken, as the others have gotten broken. And all the others have been broken by human sinfulness, and no different here. This one gets broken uh, by David in his affair with Bathsheba. And in this uh, act, David, you know, brings upon himself shame. But we see how easy it is to fall. Doesn't the, the devil attack our weaknesses uh, so easily, and so quickly to get us to trip up? But even though that happens, we see God's mercy doesn't quit. God's love doesn't give up. Because it ultimately leads to now Jesus, the sixth and final covenant, the eternal covenant. There will be no other. We are in this final covenant, you and I. And I said I wanted to connect this covenant that Jesus gives us with that Passover meal. See, one of the things that is so awesome about scripture is the Old Testament is constantly leading to the new and the new is fulfilling the old. They always work together. But it's not only on this big level, the old leading to the new and the new fulfilling the old. We even see it within. We see it within the gospels pointing to the Acts of the Apostles and the Acts of the Apostles and the rest of the, the books of the New Testament fulfilling the Gospels. We see it continually, this completeness, this wholeness. Well, recall our reading on Holy Thursday. I know it was a live stream mass this year. It was very odd for all of us. But in that first reading, it was a reading from Exodus and it was the story of the Passover. Because that Passover, that tenth and final plague that led to the freeing, ultimately, of the Israelites from the Egyptian Pharaoh and the Egyptian rule, that Passover meal was pointing to the Last Supper. Recall how Jesus tells his disciples, go ahead to Jerusalem and prepare for us the Passover meal. I look forward to celebrating this with you. And he gives them the instruction how to find where to go, they find a man, and they'd be taken to this upper room. And they prepare this meal, and on Holy Thursday, as we read and hear about this um, in the Gospels, something should strike us. Remember, there were prescriptions, there were rules with this memorial feast. So Jesus, in his Jewish tradition, was celebrating this memorial feast. But there were certain really important things missing, it seems. Remember, they were to have at this memorial feast, the Passover meal required the slaughter of a one-year-old male lamb, sheep or goat. That was missing at the Last Supper because Jesus is the Lamb of God. Now, uh, we also um, recognize that here is Jesus in this Last Supper and he's taking bread and he says, this is my body which will be given up for you. And as I've said a couple times tonight, takes the cup filled with wine, he says, this is the cup of my blood which will be poured out for you. We again see a pointing to something. My body, my blood, which will be given up for you, which will be poured out for you. Jesus is pointing to the cross where he ultimately gives us his life, where he conquers sin and death by taking it all on on the cross himself. 
the uh, final covenant, the sign is the Eucharist. Every time we celebrate Mass, we are reminded of this covenant that Jesus has brought us into. And this covenant, this eternal covenant, creates one holy church, one holy couple, one holy family, one holy tribe, one holy nation, one holy kingdom, one holy church. I love the beauty of that progression because we see that we were all created by God. We were all created in his image and likeness. And what Jesus did by conquering sin and death and rising from the dead for us, opening the gates of heaven for us, what Jesus did is he brought salvation to all of us. God had created in the beginning and God saves everyone. That's his desire. Now we have to cooperate with that. We have to cooperate with this wellspring of grace that Jesus has won for us. Uh, but what an incredible gift that we're celebrating this Easter season, this new and eternal covenant, a covenant that is so much God's love and mercy for us. He's never stopped loving us. He's never stopped chasing us. And so my friends, that's just a quick review of the beauty of covenant history. Um, and it's one of the beauties that we get when we just spend time with scripture. Um, for my parishioners that uh, are part of uh, our grouping of, of parishes, All Saints and Holy Family and St. Rose of uh, Lima, um, we, I mailed a, a letter uh, this week. And in the letter, I put forth two challenges. Um, the first challenge is dealing with uh, uh, perpetual adoration. Um, we are blessed in our seven churches and our, our grouping. Four of the, the churches uh, prior to this coronavirus outbreak um, had uh, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament with exposition uh, during the day. Um, and I want to get that back going. We can do that in this pandemic. But my challenge is this. I don't want adoration um, just in four churches. I want it in all seven. I want it in all seven because Look at how much God loves us. Let's show him our love. Let's spend a little time with our Lord. In this new and eternal covenant, let's give our Lord a little time. And so I'm challenging all of our parishioners, regardless of what parish you belong to, I would like adoration with exposition from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Saturday. We have seven churches. So uh, we're gonna have two churches on Wednesday, but then one church all the other days where there will be exposition from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. But I'm gonna need people to sign up. The letter's gonna explain how you can do that. Um, but we can do this together. What an incredible opportunity for us to really show our fire, just as God shows his love and his fire for us. The second challenge though, ties into uh, what I was just saying. My second challenge is we need to spend time with scripture. We need to spend a little bit of time every day with our Bibles. And so my challenge is this, the second challenge I'm putting forth to our parishioners is to spend five minutes every day reading from our Bibles. Now I know some people get a little intimidated. Well, I don't know where to start and uh, I don't always understand. So um, starting next Monday, uh, I'm gonna lead us through that. 
um, and we're going to start with Acts of the Apostles. So dust off your Bibles, if they might have dust, I, I'm assuming they don't, but dust off your Bibles, and next Monday, be ready to start reading five minutes from Acts of the Apostles. And each day, via flock note, I'm just going to send out just a, a little tidbit uh, on uh, for that five minutes uh, that we spend as we begin with uh, Acts of the Apostles. Just a, a great way for us to encounter our Lord. You can't read scripture. You can't spend time with scripture and not encounter our Lord. Uh, Jesus is the word made flesh. And we see that beauty in this covenant history and the stories of this covenant that we have been given. It's just an incredible gift. And so uh, I hope uh, throughout uh, the world, but uh, I'm focused very much on our parishes. I hope uh, we step up to this challenge, the perpetual uh, adoration from the 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, Monday through Saturday, and uh, the reading from our Bibles each day. Um, this is a little different uh, setting, uh, not because it's outside, but because it's uh, via Facebook Live. Um, usually in the setting I can take uh, questions. Um, uh, I know you could uh, type one in and, and I'll see it uh, uh, on the screen. We'll take a, a couple of questions if anyone uh, has any. Um, but until I see a, a question pop up, I uh, thought I'd share a, another uh, little story from uh, scripture that um, it's really easy for us to think oh, my family's crazy or my family's dysfunctional or, you know, I bet no other family acts like this. Um, but uh, I uh, have always gotten uh, a little kick out of uh, the Old Testament um, because there's some craziness that goes on as we read sacred scripture uh, in uh, um, the uh, Old Testament. And I'd like to uh, uh, share the, the story and we'll begin. We know that uh, uh, Abraham um, had his first son uh, with um, uh, the maidservant of his wife, Sarai. And that first son's name was Ishmael. But then Abraham and Sarah were blessed with um, the gift of their son, uh, Isaac. And Isaac is who Abraham then gets asked by God to sacrifice. And Abraham's faithfulness uh, takes him to that point, but Isaac is spared. Um, but it showed Abraham's faithfulness. Well, Isaac grows up and Isaac uh, gets married to Rebecca. And Isaac and Rebecca have two sons. Uh, Esau is the oldest and Jacob. Well, uh, it is in Isaac's old age, just before he dies, that he calls Esau and he is going to give Esau his blessing. And that blessing went to the oldest son. And he told Esau what he had to do. He needed to go out and get some wild game and, and prepare this tasty dish for him. And, and then Isaac was gonna give uh, this blessing to him. Well, Rebecca hears all this and Rebecca loves uh, Jacob. And so she instructs Jacob what to do. And so long story short, Jacob steals the blessing from Isaac. And in stealing uh, that blessing from Isaac, uh, it sets in motion some craziness that uh, ensues. So um, Jacob uh, takes off and he falls in love. He sees this uh, girl um, that he falls in love with and her name is Rachel. And uh, Rachel's father is Laban. And so Jacob goes to Laban and asks his permission to marry his daughter, Rachel, that he's just fallen in love with. She's, uh, he's smitten for her. Well, Laban says, sure, work for me for seven years, and then you can have my daughter in marriage. Well, 
Jacob is so head over heels for Rachel that he works for Laban for seven years. And the seven years comes to an end and uh, he goes back to Laban and Laban goes, she's up on the hill in the house, go consummate your marriage. Well, Jacob runs up there, he's so excited and he wakes up the next morning. Don't tell me how this happens, but he's like, ah! Wrong daughter. He was suddenly now with Rachel's sister, Leah, and married to her. He goes to Laban, you tricked me. And Laban said, I told you you could marry my daughter. I didn't tell you which one. Everyone knows the first one, oldest one gets married first. But I tell you what, if you're still in love with my daughter, Rachel, work for me another seven years. Um, and then you can marry her. I know, sounds a little crazy. But Jacob does that. He works another seven years and he then gets to marry Rachel. So he's now married to Rachel and Leah. Now Rachel can't have children uh, at first and, and he doesn't have any children with Leah, but uh, Rachel knows that Jacob wants to have uh, a child. So she took a, a page out of history and she tells Jacob to have a, a child with her maidservant. Well, Leah sees that Rachel has given her maidservant to Jacob to have a child. And Leah's like, no, you got her maidservant. Here's my maidservant. Well, then uh, Rachel does get pregnant and the maidservants have children and Leah has children. And now suddenly you've got one dad, Jacob, four moms, and they end up having 12 sons. The second from the youngest, they dislike Joseph. I share that with you because, you know what? I don't think most of our families are that dysfunctional. But it's also in a beautiful story of how God perseveres, even through the craziness. God perseveres even through the craziness of our lives. And we have to trust that. But we also have to recognize the devil works over time with doubt and shame and fear. And so, uh, I just share that with you as we look over this covenant history and a little tidbit back with the story of Jacob and those 12 sons become the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, and so, I just share that with you because it's an incredible gift. Um, so, I see a question here. I often hear people say, they don't understand how God allows the suffering or that suffering. Uh, your explanation of Genesis 3. Um, yeah, God doesn't impose suffering on us. Does he allow it? Yeah. God never impinges on our free will. But the devil works overtime to bring us into that suffering through the doubt, through the shame, through the fear. Remember I said the originalness, what God originally created, that original unity, for example? God desires that unity of us with him, to be one with him as he created it in the beginning. And the devil works overtime to break that up. But we see that, how we are made, this is just sort of the foundation of the theology of the body. Because if we're made in the image and likeness of God, we have to look at God. Well, God, that, you know, trinity of persons. We have God the Father. And God the Father wills all goodness to his son. That's what we call love. Love is an action. Willing all goodness to another. And that's what the Father does to his son. And God the Son receives all of that. And in receiving all of that goodness, the Son entrusts himself to the Father. And that love between the Father and Son goes back and forth. And from that love comes forth the Holy Spirit. Well, we image that. So if you just look at God and man, God wills all goodness to man, to us. So that we then entrust ourselves completely to God. So where does the devil throw in doubt, shame, and fear? He throws it in. God wills all goodness 
so that we entrust ourselves completely. And what does the devil do? He inserts doubt, he inserts shame, he inserts fear to break down that relationship, that original oneness of how we were created. And so we have to recognize um, what God really created in us. What God ultimately saved by sending his son, placing us in this new and eternal covenant. We have to recognize what our Lord Jesus has done by conquering sin and death and willing this wellspring of grace. But God never impinges on our free will. And sin, unfortunately, is a choice. And so, we're complex, but it's an incredible gift that uh, God has given us. Um, how do we help someone who we think may be suffering to attacks by the devil, such as strong doubt and anxiety? Um, well, first is praying for that person. Um, but I repeatedly, if I encounter that, um, I explain um, what I just explained, you know, what the devil does. Doubt and shame and fear are not of God. Um, and, but the devil works overtime using those tools uh, in his toolkit. And so besides praying just in our conversations with individuals that really struggle uh, with that it's helping them to encounter God's love and and trust that love and then we have to trust God's desire for us um, we have to seek to understand Lord what is it you want for me I always tell people um, oftentimes when we're stressed out, when we're, when we're pushed to the limits, um, and, and we're so frustrated, we just, you know, sort of cry out to God, God, what is it you want from me? Well, the answer is simple. God wants nothing from us. It's the wrong question. He's God. He doesn't need anything from us. However, the better question is, Lord, God, what is it you want from for me. The most dangerous prayer we pray could be the Our Father. Um, the you know, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Lord, what is it you desire for me? And to trust God means we have to become vulnerable. We have to become vulnerable and let go of being in control. Um, and I really think the, the devil works overtime to use doubt uh, and anxiety to try and make us want to be in control. And so it's, it's letting go of control. It's becoming vulnerable to completely trust in God. Um, I saw a couple questions go up, but they went by too fast, so I apologize for missing them. But um, thank you for taking the time to uh, be uh, uh, with us uh, tonight. I say us, even though I'm here by myself. Um, uh, I know I can see lots of people uh, watching and, and I just thank you for taking this time out of your schedules. Um, and as I said, we usually do it, uh, the Theology on Tap traditionally, on the last Thursday of the month. Um, this is the second to the last Thursday because I wanted to make up for March and so I am going to do another one uh, next Thursday uh, same time same place unless it's raining then I might be inside my house but uh, same time same place 7 p.m. Central Time next Thursday April 30th and um, again uh, I will uh, uh, send out a, a reminder and I will also uh, um, put out the the topic um, but between now and then, uh, feel free to uh, send me questions that you might have. I'm happy to 
uh, answer those and I will look and and I will follow up on any of these questions that I missed uh, tonight because they went by too fast. Um, I will uh, uh, bring those up at the beginning of next week. Um, and uh, I just look forward to spending this time with you in sort of this crazy weird time, uh, but knowing that uh, God is with us and God never stops chasing us. That's his love uh, for each of us. And so thank you for spending this time uh, with me tonight. Anyway, with that, the Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless each of you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Have a great evening. And uh, I'm now going to enjoy this one beer. Uh, I like Stella, so I've been looking forward to it. Thank you, and God bless.